Okay, now that we've learned a lot about the acoustic signals of speech, it's time to think about how those signals are actually encoded by our auditory system. So this will be the first in the series of little video capsules about the auditory system and how we process sound. And they're going to include basically five general topics. So today in the first one, we're really going to think about just identifying the main landmarks and the functions of the different major divisions of the auditory system. And in the next one, we'll really dig into some of the details about um, how the different frequencies are handled um, by the basilar membrane. And we'll learn very special terminology like tonotopicity. We'll learn how frequencies are processed nonlinearly, um, a concept that some of you might remember from our um, topics on the, just the basic physics of sound. Um, and we'll learn a lot about outer hair cells. So even though this isn't a full class on the auditory system or hearing science, I think if there's going to be one major thing that you learn about hearing, it should really be about outer hair cells. They really do a lot. Um, the third capsule will be about how we perceive loudness. That'll be the shortest one of this series. And then the final two will be um, two very major features of you know how we hear, um, how we hear pitch and how we use both ears together, especially as we're trying to localize sound in the air around us. So that'll be the binaural hearing lecture there. So let's start with some of the basic landmarks and functions of the auditory system. Um, and we can think of this as a pathway of sound transmission from the outside, from, you know, in the air around us into the brain. So in this first part, the outer ear, we're really just thinking about the, you know, the visible part of the ear, the pinna, that sort of like goofy shape <laughs> that's on the side of your head. Um, the function of this isn't really to transmit any messages. It's really the same function as if you just cupped your hand to the side of your ear and just tried to gather some more sound. Um, secondarily, it will also shape the spectrum. And we'll talk about that a little bit when we get into binaural hearing as well. The actual ear canal does a little bit of filtering of the sound, so it'll actually help to resonate a certain frequency range um, in the same way that we would do, you know, for a vocal track. Because it has a specific set of dimensions, a length and width, um, it's going to facilitate certain sounds in addition to just sort of protecting um, the, the, the fine structures inside, the delicate structures inside. So once we're into the part of the tympanic membrane, the middle ear, the job really is to convert changes in air pressure to mechanical pressure. Or in other words, convert the acoustic sounds in the air into movement of physical things, physical parts in the ear. So here we're thinking about the three little bones in there, the malleus, incus, and stapes. Um, these make up the ossicle chain, um, and they, they reside in the middle ear. And that's really, we're going to talk about that quite a bit today. Um, their main role is to amplify that mechanical energy. After that, we're into the inner ear, the cochlea. And so there are a couple different parts of the cochlea that we'll talk about primarily in the next lecture capsule. But here we're thinking about the basilar membrane and the inner hair cells. So in the basilar membrane, we're thinking about separating the frequency components because we know a lot of relevant sounds like speech have a lot of different frequencies at the same time, and we need some mechanism of actually separating them all out. And then the inner hair cells actually take those separated components, convert the signals into electrical energy, which is really the currency of how the brain operates. And it's going to initiate the transmission of those electrical signals to the brain via the auditory nerve. So let's think about those three little bones. And this is just a picture of them on a dime just for size, just so you can appreciate just how incredibly small they are. So just to think about their role, I want us to jump ahead by one, um, just so we can know what, what the job is of this whole middle ear structure. The idea here is to think about, you know, after those middle ears, the energy is going to be transferred into the inner ear, which is actually fl filled with fluid. And so what you want to think about is what happens if you're traveling through the air and suddenly you encounter a lot of fluid. This is sort of like belly flopping into the pool. And as you can see from this little image from CNN, belly flops can cause injuries. And this isn't really a PSA for your safety. It's just to, you know, just like leverage your intuition for knowing that flopping into the pool hurts. And it's because water is more resistant to your motion than air is. And so if we're going to think about this in acoustic terms, if we're going to preserve the acoustic energy transfer from the outside air to the inner ear, which is fluid filled, it's going to have to overcome that increased resistance. And so the job of the middle ear is to overcome that increased resistance by amplifying the energy. So there are three main ways that it does this. And the primary way 
is the what we call the area ratio of the eardrum to the stapes foot plate. And what I'm referring to here on this diagram, here circled is the eardrum or the tympanic membrane. And circled there in purple is the stapes foot plate or the last bit of the last ossicle right before it hits the inner ear. And as you can see, there are different sizes. So all the pressure that's being applied to the green circle is being narrowed down and applied to that purple soaker. And so, so let's think about, you know, an analogy for this. If you're in a Minnesota winter, right, and you want to walk through the snow, you can put on these snowshoes. And the idea here is that they're wider than your feet. And so what you're doing is you're dispersing all that pressure in a large area. And in doing so, you can stay above the snow because it's not going to force its way all the way through the snow. Conversely, if you think about this little doggo over here, um, the idea is that, you know, he has tiny little feet. And so that's where, that's why he's up to his neck in snow is because all the pressure of the dog is being concentrated on little small areas on his feet. And so he's going to sink right through. So the idea here is that in the ear, it's really going on our diagram, at least from left to right. You're taking a lot of pressure and concentrating it onto a small spot, sort of like that little dog. The second action is what we call lever action of the ossicles. And what we're referring to here is that, you know, the ossicles have different sizes. And so the idea of it being a lever is that on the side that's smaller, if you produce just a little movement, then on the side that's larger, that's going to translate to a lot of movement. And so you're essentially, again, just amplifying the amount of energy that's being transferred through. The final um, mechanism here of amplifying the energy is what we call the buckling of the eardrum. This one's a little bit difficult to explain in just static terms on the screen here, but it, the, it's the idea that the eardrum isn't a flat surface. It's not just a disc. It actually has a little bit of curvature to it so that when it's going inside to outside from convex to concave, it's actually sort of buckling a little bit as it goes through that central area. And so one analogy you can think of for this is like a baseball cap. So imagine that we're thinking about the very top of this and we're going to move it up and down. Now, of course, you know, the top of the cap is dome shaped and so it's not flat. So when it goes down, it doesn't, it's, it's sort of difficult to hold the cap in that exact flat position. It's easier to actually make it go all the way inside out. And so imagine just transferring back and forth between the up and the down position, you're really just more easily going all the way up to all the way down and just really um, swiftly breezing through that middle area. So the, the, because the tympanic membrane has that curvature to it, it's going to um, more smoothly go from in and out with a little bit more energy. And so the combination of these three really can overcome that, that increase in resistance that we see as the energy goes from the mechanical uh, processing of the middle ear into the fluid processing, or at least the fluid filled uh, inner ear. So again, those the names of those bones, we have the malleus, the incus, and the stapes. The malleus is the one that's just on the edge of the tympanic membrane. And then the stapes is the one that connects us to the next stage in the chain, the inner ear. So a recap here of our middle ear. Um, what you want to think about is how does it overcome impedance mismatch? That's its job. And what it does is amplify sound to do that. So the need for amplification is, again, because we're transferring energy from a low impedance environment, which is air, to a higher impedance environment, which is the fluid-filled inner ear. And so by, by having this amplification, we're ensuring that the energy is maintained at the same level, even though you're encountering a fluid-filled space. So you're basically trying to not lose any acoustic power. So this amplification happens to all the frequencies that we hear, and the middle ear doesn't contain any hair cells. So the hair cells are what we're going to talk about in the next segment. Okay, so now we think about the inner ear, um, and the word cochlea is pretty synonymous with inner ear. Um, so the cochlea is where most of the action happens, and it's going to really take up a lot of our time for the next lecture. But because this is just the broad overview, what we want to think about for the cochlea is it analyzes the frequency components of a complex signal, which is just any signal that has uh, multiple components. And for each of those components, what it needs to do is convert mechanical information or convert motion to a chemical signal and then that chemical signal to an electrical signal because electrical signals are the ones that will ultimately transmit to the brain. So here, it, it, the, the cochlea has a lot of different transformations. So 
it's going to be, it's going to have a lot of things set into motion. Um, a lot of cells will respond in sequence. And then ultimately the inner hair cells will trigger the auditory nerve to send things toward the brain. So just to really illustrate the importance of this, let's just think about what a complex signal is. Um, so if we view a waveform and think about, let's say like a hundred Hertz tone, like this is a pretty simple tone here. Um, if we combine it with a 200 Hertz tone, um, of course, this is not what the signal looks like. These are both of them separated. What we get when we add them together is this complex signal here. And this is really the, the variance in pressure that actually happens through the air, and therefore it's what the eardrum gets. So this is not really useful yet because what we need to do is separate it back out into its component pieces. So what we need to do is divide this back into the 100 and 200 hertz components. And that's essentially what the cochlea does. And it doesn't just do it for, you know, for sounds that have two components. It can do it for sounds with any number of components. So here I've just combined 100, 371, 914. And again, the same principle applies. So essentially what we're doing here is showing a complex tone decomposed in the time domain because we're showing waveforms. But really, it's, really, it's kind of like the inner ear's job is, is similar to what we do in a spectrum. We take this waveform and we divide it into its individual frequency components. And so these components are what we're going to see represented on the basilar membrane in the next video. And the way that the ear does this is sort of the way that we can think about these little manual coin counters, right? So if you think about this device, right, you put all your coins in on the right and you just send them through these slots and just depending on exactly like their size and the size of the hole that they can fall through, they're all going to end up in the correct spot. So the ear, in the same way that this coin counter works passively, the ear will have passive organizational principles that will divide the frequency components um, and that'll basically solve the job for us. And again, we'll get into that in the next video. The final link in this chain here that we'll talk about in this unit is the auditory nerve. And, and the auditory nerve has a lot of complexity. We won't get into it a whole lot. Um, and so obviously if you're interested in that, you'll want to take a class on, on hearing science proper. Um, but the main idea here is that the auditory nerve is the conduit between the inner ear and the higher level um, subcortical brain structures like the brain stem, the midbrain, um, and those structures eventually send that information to the brain. And so the auditory nerve operates not by motion of things, um, like the motion of the basilar membrane or the eardrum, but only in terms of action potentials, which are just little spikes of electrical activity. And so the different kinds of information that the auditory nerve transmits is basically, you know, which nerves are firing, that'll tell us sort of like what frequency is there, and the rate of their firing, which tells us about the frequency and the loudness and the, the timing and, uh, of onset and offset of events. So it's a pretty simple code, but it, it accomplishes everything that we hear is really transmitted through this very simple auditory nerve firing code. And just to, you know, spark your interest a little bit in this, the auditory nerve, when you actually strip away all the other components that, that surround it, has this amazing shape. So it's, it has this spiral shape because it, of course, innervates a spiral shaped organ, the cochlea, and all those different nerve fibers branch out to innervate um, where, where the endpoints of the basilar membrane and the inner hair cells ultimately terminate. So the spiral ganglion is a pretty amazing um, piece of a, a nervous system structure that is super fast, super responsive, and is responsible for transmitting really complex, detailed information to the brain. So um, stay tuned for the next capsule where we're going to talk about um, more in, involved in the inner ear, the transmission of frequencies, the decomposition of frequencies, the motion of the basilar membrane, and how those components are coded uh, in the cochlea.